Welcome back to High Performance Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 1.1. And this is about introduction to C programming and scheduling. And admittedly, it's really a very short introduction. So this is not at all a whole course on C programming and equally also not a whole course on scheduling. But at least it captures the essence of what you really need for this course in order to play a little bit with C programs um, and then, of course, executing them on HPC machines, which requires some sort of batch, batch access. And this is what we want to basically understand a little bit with the idea of sch using schedulers, scheduling, concurrent access, basically all on the same time here on the supercomputers on the H machines um, that are available. But before we start with the material of this lecture, let us look what we had the last time. And the last time was really the first real lecture on conceptual topics, basically an overview of high performance computing um, and actually also clarifying a couple of terminologies, which is very important to understand. Firstly, when you think about the HPC basics, um, certainly there are architectures in HPC which are very relevant. Um, there are different ways how you basically build so such high performance computing. And then, of course, on the other end, also how you program them. And this is a little bit related. We learned that basically many of the architectures, let it be basically shared memory or distributed memory, in one respect um, refers to an architecture part, or on the other hand, of course, reflects how you would program them. So when you think perhaps one of the basic ingredients of such a high performance computing is still a CPU, you see today we have this multi-core processors, um, still all of these cores, even if it's multi-core, have still single, uh, high single thread performance and different cache levels really here, which uh, enable us um, to have a very good speed to the memory. And with this, it's of course all on one chip. And if you want one of the smallest ingredient of a HPC machine. The interesting thing is then that you basically have these kind of chips and you integrate them um, on several different pieces, as we learned last time, that such a rack is really having mid planes, having note cards, having, you know, basically different parts in order to have now many, really, really many of these processors within the HPC machine. And this means then you have different nodes, which you see a little bit here reflected then, essentially. And of course, this is just a play example, a toy example. Um, in a real HPC system, you would have much more nodes. So <clears throat> this is then used for parallel programming. And while you can think about that, basically, all of these processors, which are then integrated in such HPC systems, um, have then basically their own lifetime. You see this a bit, a bit also what you could say is a lifeline here of the processors which basically is doing some interesting task. Now, the first idea we then re really looked at how we can actually then really program in parallel was alluding a little bit to the idea of arranging these processes then in the so-called distributed memory architecture, and then using this in these architectures with the so-called message passing interface. This was sort of a 10,000 feet introduction because in lecture two, the next one tomorrow, we will start actually real with hands-on um, with the MPI, and then you basically will learn much more. But the key essence to take away was really this, what the name suggests, a message passing. So you essentially have here sent and receives, you have a point-to-point -point communication, as we would say later in lecture two, and then in advanced lectures, you will also have something kind of uh, block um, messages, if you want, so really collectives, as we call them, involving then all the processors, or more accurately, those which are in a specific communicator. But these are already, let's say, advanced topics, but this is reflecting one of the ways how you basically program them now. And if you have now the idea of these processors that you see here, um, each of them has the memory, and the so-called trouble, if you want, in one respect, is that the other processor obviously cannot access just simply this cache of the other or the RAM or the memory of the other processor. Hence, what we have to do is we have to always go to a network communication network um, that basically enables us to access then the memory of another processor. And this is what required in if you really do parallel computing. 
And we will learn basically in lecture two, then there are certain directives like the MPI send receive that then can actually use some of the data that you have here in the memory and put it, so to speak, in the memory of another process in order to work and work on it. Um, needless to say, if you have cutting edge applications which require, let's say, uh, lots of low latency, um, like weather forecast between different elements, basically over the domain you want to simulate, then this would be a very powerful communication network. And hence, here we learned that high performance computing is really fueled by the interconnections that you see between the nodes um, with InfiniBand, so that this message exchange is very fast. It looks a little bit like wild here, and obviously there are certain paradigms and patterns what you can learn how to do MPI programming. But this is not the idea of the first couple of lectures, so we will start very basically how you can have a simple C program, and hence that's why we have also today an introduction to C, and basically how we meant this C program then with MPI statements to learn a little bit about send and receives and so forth. Now, we also learned that essentially there's a certain perspective of using memory more fast and more powerful by actually using threads in a shared memory fashion. This is different from distributed memory in respect that every of these different threads that you see here have access basically to the same shared address space of the memory. So we see here again basically reads and writes, reads and writes, and hence this is not really a send and receive like here. Basically you see here reads and writes from memory. and this is true for shared memory architecture parts. So where basically you see here on a chip and so on, on these sockets, uh, the chipset, they can basically have all access to this memory. And we had said there's this uh, NUMA and CC NUMA, um, which is basically the same idea, just that you buy one of them have this core end link that enables us then as programmers there, they have the shared address memory space while in Reality, it's a little bit distributed memory, as you see here, but it enables us to program in a way that we can still have the shared memory address space. Hence, the idea is here really using the high performance within the node, so to speak, all the processors that can basically all then access the memory. But we also learned that this, of course, is heavily limited. If you want to really scale across nodes and really scale up as a HPC machine, to many, many, perhaps hundreds of thousands of nodes, then of course you have problems by just having shared memory programming, it's impossible. So what is the idea there? You basically combine it with distributed memory. So you would say you do shared memory within a node and then distributed memory across a node, which you see a little bit here then, uh, where you basically can then put in that this part of the processor would be then either this or that. This is, of course, more than elaborate examples, and we will talk about this, of course, in one of the next couple of lectures. So the next part we had was a little bit more looking on the HPC ecosystem technologies. We had the idea that basically the problem of CPUs today uh, and in the past was more and more that putting more cores on the chip gets errors because they're all very high frequency or high clock frequency. They're getting very hot. So one of the ideas is to create something called a many core processor instead, which has then hundreds of thousands of cores, but only on a medium performance. Hence, they are not so hot. And with this, you can put just more and more on the chip. And this is the idea of the so-called GPUs, a graphical processing unit with a device memory here, which usually has to be fueled still by a host CPU and via the memory of the host CPU. So standalone GPUs are currently on the horizon, but still the majority that is the practice out there today still requires a host CPU to put the data in their memory. And then from this memory, you can upload it to the device memory and then basically let it execute on the many cores. So this is a concept called acceleration. So accelerate your normal program that you have with so-called GPUs. And by far in the moment, uh, let's say market share is given by NVIDIA, although several different vendors are now catching up significantly. And the way how you can nicely see the computation here is essentially many of independent computing parts. You see here the matrix vector multiplication, where you have this color coding, which suggests that in order to basically compute this particular part, uh, this very simple example, of course, think about now that we would talk about a matrix of maybe 100 
and thousand in the direction not four by four, but much more bigger. Still, the idea is that you can independently compute this beautifully based here on the color code. In other words, you don't need anything else, any other column basically um, in this different matrix. And with this, it's independent parallel and beautiful to put on a GPU. It doesn't require massive computing in all of these different parts, but overall, of course, you compute a lot. But of course, you can crunch down the problem in a way that's really independent. And today, we have this really in, in many different application areas, um, more notably in deep learning, where we will talk about in one of the subsequent lectures. Once we have established really the basics of HPC, MPI, and OpenMP with shared memory programming, then we will talk a little bit about GPUs and accelerators and using them in deep learning. You see a deep learning network here um, where lots of tensors actually compute here. Tensors is a multidimensional matrix if you want and basically a 3D matrix, for instance, if you want as examples here. But it really doesn't matter because if you look down to all of these matrix, matrix multiplication or matrix vector multiplication sometimes, these are all simple operations. And hence, you can nicely basically put this problem on a GPU and let it compute independently for these certain parts. And However, this is not only used anymore in machine learning or deep learning today. So this has, of course, a big effect in deep learning, as we will learn, and as we have also discussed in the first lecture. So you would say deep learning today is really only possible if you use GPUs. You can compute it on a CPU, but it's not really fun. It takes quite a long time. And still, by many of the different elements that we have today, um, different networks, here's one of them, here's a more basically another type of network um, with basically having an encoder decoder structure um, where you have also again the same concept of matrix matrix multiplications and so on so and since this is already computation comp um, expensive the idea is also to think more broadly and think about hyperparameter optimization you see here several of the hyperparameters for such a network like this where you have lots of elements to choose from as a deep learning engineer or machine learning engineer. And nobody is saying that this is the best. So you basically can play around with these values, something we call hyperparameter optimization. You don't need to do the optimizer SGD. You maybe do Adam, another optimizer, or you basically adjust the learning rate from one to something else. And there are many options. And by every time computing this with the different options, the computational capacity we need is massively increasing. So hence, uh, this deep learning is really also a case for HPC. And we have learned also that big data is another case for HPC when we were comparing it, for instance, to an earthquake simulation that you have a little bit looking here. We were comparing this from a Terra shake to a Peter shake, right? Obviously, there's much more big data to compute. Um, there's much more elements really that you want to um, basically in detail simulate. Because the more or the fine granular the meshes basically of the simulation domain, the better usually the simulation is. And of course, this requires or basically in turn also generates then big data, which we have seen in the last lecture. Now on the horizon today, and our research group has already several publications, is basically quantum computing. So it's not something which will basically come down the road in 20 years and boring, boring right now. So this is really a hot topic. It's very active in the EuroHPC joint undertaking domain. There are different um, quantum computing devices already being installed right now in the European um, ecosystem of EuroHPC. Quantum computing, hence, in one way or another, is basically seen as, as aligned with HPC. Whilst today, I think many of our applications still see quantum computing as an accelerator of type of, um, you know, device still there are different computing devices and of course we have a complete lecture then also toward the end of the course where we talk about more so let us come however to today and the idea is really thinking slowly now how we come to real parallel programming but before we do so we need a couple of basics how to operate on a hpc system using a scheduler understanding that it's basically several different users at the same time using the hpc machines and with this, we need a concept and a program that really helps us. On top of it, um, we want to do this, of course, for some real coding. 
Um, we use here C programming because many of the domains that we face have still C codes, and we will talk about this now in the lecture. Hence, we will look firstly on a little bit of the details what I do need for programming and compiling C programs. We will go stepwise through one very, very simple C program, the Hello World, as probably every one of you know, and then basically see also the context in the HPC machine. So what is the module environment we really need in order to execute this simple C program? And we have compilers and then running this C program and we'll basically leave on a sad note and we'll say, well, executing C programs on HPC systems is not good but only in a very specific part, and this refers to the login node. Hence, of course, we want to submit C programs and we want to execute them, but the way of executing them on a really login node is usually not the modus operandi. You shouldn't do that. Instead, you basically share, of course, the whole system with others. You would use a scheduler, which is then the second part of the course hours today, where we talk about what is a scheduler, um, why we need this as multi-user system environment tool, and what other pieces are there out there which basically helps us with this, and how it actually also works together with the module environment, right? Because we want to have, of course, the power of the module environment that we clarified in our last practical lecture, but we also want them enabled, of course, in the scheduling area. So we look in some scheduling scripts, we will execute them, um, and admittedly, of course, it's a very simple idea of executing on the hel our Hello World example before we really then tomorrow will start with MPI, which then, of course, gets more and more advanced in terms of C programming and then also how we use a scheduler really for real world examples. But today is really, let's say, a very low level introduction, it's very you know, simple to really get everyone on the pace here of what basically a C program is and how we use it with scheduling. If you do so, we basically know a little bit about the HPC environment tools in much more detail, especially with a specific part of supporting programming now, right? But also, of course, with the scheduling, really how to use high performance clusters, right? And how to use all these multi-user environments. And this was basically this part here really refers to so that you make basically a very simple step over already towards power programming, but you just have the basics here to see. And in the next lectures, we will then extend this step by step and in the practical lectures then with MPI. And then you do really instead of just C programming, parallel C programming. But this requires certain steps to be taken. And the motivation, so to speak, why we do this is just here. <laughs> Another very good example you see here two cutting edge HPC applications, which have enormous requirements of computing capacity. You see here the example of a terrestrial system where you want to understand the groundwater modeling, for instance, where you have three codes, uh, basically a land cover model here that is interacting then with the water with the atmospheric model Cosmo and then with the subsurface power flow. And if you have this part just highlighted here, this power flow hydrological parallel applications, you see parallel suggests already we basically have a certain domain of the Earth and we basically put them in these blocks. This is called domain decomposition and we have a whole lecture three talking about this um, where we will dive then into the idea of how we actually crunch down a big problem into smaller. You see also here is in the atmosphere another part, domain decomposition and you can couple all of these applications with the so-called OASIS coupler. We will also talk about, and all of them have different C routines. And the power flow applications, for instance, also completely written in C. So very interesting material. And you see the scientific applications of today are not directly all in Java. We're talking rather about C and Fortran codes today. And you see here several other examples already, basically in plasma physics, bioinformatics. Um, here's another one from the neuroscience simulation domain. Basically, it's a kind of a simulator of the human brain called NEST. It's so-called a spiking neural network model that aims to, let's say, simulate parts of the human brain, if you want. And it's also a highly optimized C kernel in C++ that is used here. 
So while we not really dive into that very much, um, we have simple applications for you in the HPC course that should just motivate why C is very important in the course and basically why in, you know, in your realism coming then maybe to some HPC system after the course or after your graduation, um, chances are that you face a C code when you want to do parallel programming or basically help and join a team that has already several codes that you see here. Here you see many different application examples of our simulation and data labs, where we team up together with Iceland and Jülich in different application domain in order then to simulate interesting parts. You see here, perhaps another climate model or so. And many of these applications are basically still in C. So much for the motivation, of course, for us, we want to have a hands on here. Step one, you can imagine when we want to do this really, we do the usual workaround, and I have here already mobile X term. There you remember that we basically have the idea of first going to this Krafla system because um, I'm here in the moment, not really within the university network. So to reach it from the outside, we go to Krafla first. And once we have been logging into Krafla, um, we basically can then go to Uton. I will increase the font size here a little bit so that you see that better. And now the next part of it is to maybe first understand where we are. Um, we have learned that basically we can use the hostname-f command, for instance, here to have now the confirmation that we're on Krafla. But we also learned that this is not basically what we really want here. Um, we want to go to the Uton system, but this is now within the university network. And as we are now within the university network, we can actually access it. For those of you who are in the campus, for those of you basically who have, you know, basically the living quarters on the university land and have also access to the university network, of course, you don't need to do the workaround around Krafla. And also, if you use one of the workstations of the university, but of course, Sometimes we work from home and this is also a possibility to basically use and just simply Krafla. You see the typical welcome screen. Um, we discussed this already last time in the uh, basically lecture about HPC systems at large. So I don't want to go there more into detail. Of course, we are not really interested. Are we really on Uton? And it seems like it is. So that means, in other words, we should have our still old directory from the other practical lecture we had before, if you remember where we talked a little bit about, um, about basically uh, interesting Unix command like print working directory, for instance, here's a 2023 HPC course. In this, there was this interesting file that we had, if you remember the last time, test file Uton, and to go towards MPI programming, I already created here an MPI um, uh, folder and it's important for you also to keep a bit your data structured. So when you do the assignments, I recommend also to create directories, um, which gives you a little bit of help uh, um, really where you are, what you do with what application. If you put all in one directory, you will see later with scheduling, it gets quite basically hard to understand and you don't have really the perfect overview and can debug it more quickly. Um, so basically that's why you should really create these directories. Several of the practical steps I will show now is obviously also on the slides for you to check. Um, my hope is also that we soon can touch metal on the system. So we will visit you to actually in the computing department. And as you see here, the slides reflect our SSH um, basically coming into the system. So <clears throat> then to motivate already that we're moving towards uh, C programming, I already provided you with a hello directory here um, where we will look into it. And you see I already have here an interesting um, program created, Hello C. So Hello C is a very, very simple program. It includes the standard IO, um, basically header, which are header files in C often included that have then the, the, the kind of features and the libraries that we need. And we will talk about this more when we also include the MPI library in the next part of the course hours and the lectures coming up. But today we really want the simplest C program more or less possible with a main function that you have to program 
And here you see that the printf statement would just give us out hello world. Uh, you have this return command, which is used basically to say if this program was executed correctly or if it was basically executed incorrectly. So there are different ways. <clears throat> this is basically how you can return here. In our case, I mean, there's not really very much which could go wrong in this couple of lines. So what we expect is that this program will give us out hello world. That looks all good. And let's go out again. You see also from the type here, we have a typical hello.c text file. Um, you also see this hello basically already in yellow. Uh, this this green hello here, which is the executable, um, which I now want to remove just for the sake that, you know, um, we will recompile it now, which is now the important part. We have a basically typical idea of a C program. Let's go back to the slides, perhaps, um, where, of course, many of these parts I just had, as I described them, are a little bit better defined and basically how you can use it. So we have this simple ingredient, the C program. And now the next step is, of course, using a C compiler to get an executable, right? And um, this is something which um, we will basically check normally with our module environment. Do we have basically, for instance, a nice GNU uh, compiler available? And for later lecture, I already uh, would like to have um, the OpenMPI open as well. So we do our normal stuff that we have learned already. You would think the HPC system module environment, we learned that the module environment tool is there very powerful. Um, you know, we have this module avail, for instance, which shows us then all the modules that's available here. And from that, we basically then um, can analyze what are the different systems we have available. Is there basically a GNU available? Basically, we see that's possible. And in terms of the idea of using then, uh, let's say later on, basically in the last couple of lectures that are coming, then MPI, we see also OpenMP. I is also available, right? Um, so this is important to check. And when we then um, want to compile, we learned that basically if you want a specific compiler that I would here introduce, um, we want to basically always do first the module load again, something what we already alluded to, right, in the last practical lecture where we said we before we do anything with this modules, we have to load them. I maybe do this a bit clear here and would say module load. And here, the first interested one is GNU, but also for us, um, perhaps not necessarily needed here because we basically have not directly the MPI um, statements in, but I want to make the case for you already to just extend the C program later with MPI directives. So in order to learn this more simply, it makes sense to already load these modules. Um, and while they're now loaded, as we can use a simple MPI uh, CC compiler with the hello C program that we have. And my suggestion is that you a little bit um, also always specify and learn to use a minus O to have a very specific executable, um, which is then basically a binary code. So we cannot look into this anymore, but it should be having a proper name basically. And you can steer this name with minus O. By doing so, is a very small program. Let's go back to this directory. We have seen that basically the hello is suddenly appearing again, which is good news. So that means we have an executable again. Um, the word executable in one respect is also reflected in this X that you see here in the rights. Um, this is again a part for every file um, on every folder that you see. You see here the rights of different elements of users, groups, and so on. And if there's an X that usually refers to executable and the hello is basically also here in this nice editor, also nicely marked as an executable here in green. So it's extra simple for you. Hence, we can see that the compilation that we have done here is basically working. So we have created an executable. Now, what we don't know yet is if the executable is correct. So if there's actually something to execute. So I think the next step would be then clearly let's execute, which you can do, for instance, like this. This refers to the current directory you're in. And let's say we want to execute hello here. 
So location where you execute something will be an important part in our next basically course hours when we think about part two using the scheduler. It's therefore very important that you get the understanding of which executable you really want to execute. Here it's pretty trivial. We are in the same directory, right? So that means we have here hello and when it's executed, indeed, it gives us a printf and it gives us a printf on the screen. It's also another part which will be different when we use a batch system and the scheduler in the second part. Once again, if we go maybe in to explain this a bit more, the idea is here to have an output, right? And in the moment, um, this is for us the screen. So we see hello world on the screen. And basically an important part is that I can also, of course, change this um, while you basically can see when we were going out here, it looks a bit not nice with no really, um, you know, change of the next line. So let's make this a bit more beautifully. But also to understand it again, what we can do. <clears throat> you do this here and backslash n. Then, for instance, we have a line break within and we basically write and quit, right? Once again, we now have changed the C file. And this is a common mistake my students usually do. We have changed the C text file, the source code file. We did not change the executable. Yes, we not in compiled. Right. This is important to take away. That means when I do now the execution of hello, all what happens is that I have the old executable and I compiled the old executable with the old code. That means, in other words, our hello world remains the same like this. Right. So it doesn't take into account the changes of this because I have to recompile. I, the, every change I do to the source code in a C program, and many of you know that from Java, whatever language you have, you basically have to then put it back to the compiler. And I said to you in previous lectures, use the up arrow on the keyboard. It's very helpful to maybe navigate through the history of your commands. And air voila, you have the MPICC hello C minus oh hello. When I now do this, it will have used the new source code and created the executable. And with this, oops. Then we basically have the new executable available. And when we now do the same command, I do the up arrow again to have the old command. Suddenly there's a line break. Why? Because we recompiled and basically now we have this proper executable that reflects the source code directly. Now, this is uh, <clears throat> interestingly enough, a very simple uh, approach. And by now, I think many of you think that's uh, uh, very trivial. But I see now and then that people really forgot actually to compile and then they are basically having not the executable in sync and then sometimes debug things which are not reflected in the executable and vice versa in one respect. So basically you can say that you really should be making this as a blueprint in your mind. You added the source code file. Every time you added the source code, did some changes, you want to recompile, right? And then the changes are reflected in the code. Now, finally, um, this was ob obviously something I have here also partly in the slides, so don't worry. And we will come to this back again and again. We see module loads, we see GNU Open MPI. Just here, um, what that means actually is essentially that Open MPI is an implementation of the MPI standard that we will also learn in the next lecture. Um, so this is also not Open MP. That is a library from shared memory. This is often an exam question, by the way. So OpenMP and OpenMPI are different things. OpenMP is a standard for shared memory programming, and OpenMPI is an implementation of the standard from MPI for distributed computing programming. But, you know, you will basically see that in the next lecture much more. What I wanted to just point out that, you know, Always check the HPC system module environments um, when you basically execute some source codes. Um, of course, the GNU was now very trivial. We need that. Okay, for OpenMPI, for instance, we have done so. You see here, if you want to do OpenMPI in some specific version, you can module spider it and then understand this module can only be loaded before you have basically to load, so to speak, GNU. So that shows us we do this module load GNU. And then mod in, in the same, we can have then the same line module load um, open MPI. 
Now, of course, the similar way you would do if you are, let's say, a large scale programmer already. So let's say students or PhD students from me that created, for instance, this parallel HP DB scan algorithm for clustering of data. You see here that's a clustering algorithm um, where you basically have some data points. And if they are very close together, let's say in Euclidean distance, then you would call it a cluster. And we have done this, for instance, on brain images um, from the human brain slices in order to identify cortical layers here. There's different colors, which all have a different, let's say, um, distance. And that's how you identify these different layers and where clustering can help. But the way the application is now not the important part of it, what I want to leave you rather on the table is that this is also a typical module that people have already installed that you can equally basically use in your module load command, right? And you see usually people already have seen it's an MPI version, it's an open MP version, so compiled uh, against different, let's say, uh, compilers, which is also often used, but we will also learn this over and over again. Basically, you will also see in the second part of this course overall, we have ANSYS and Fluent, uh, where we will also talk about um, later in the course, which relates already to CFD problems and so forth. Now, load the right modules, that's what we have done. Uh, just summarizing here and basically um, want to close on one remark in the first part before we really go then to the scheduling. So what I have done is something what usually you should not do. Now that sounds strange, I know. So we executed on the login node um, while a little bit compilation, a little bit of executing perhaps to check is always not so dramatic. Uh, usually the way it works is that you don't want to execute something on the login node because this is obviously shared with many, many different users that all use the HPC system. And um, the way how this works is that the different login systems where you of course, log in as the name suggests. But then if you really want to compute, you would use the compute nodes. And I have for you here a little bit the overview. If you remember from the last time, we had this interesting Ganglia system uh, where we can see the load of U-turn right now. It's a monitoring tool. And you see here clearly that we have this different computing nodes, compute 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, 2, 3, and a login node called U-turn. Right, and this is now the interesting part that motivates a little bit the second lecture now that will come directly after this part. What means scheduling? In other words, we say from this U-turn, we will do some specific commands, some batch processing in order to execute jobs sometimes on compute 2021-2223. Obviously, this is a very small system. Now think about, and I will motivate this a little bit more when we come to the second part of the course, Usually HPC machines are much bigger. This is a, let's say, more or less teaching cluster. That's why it's small, but it still serves our purpose and understand also the basic principles. Hence, um, take away the message that this is not so really the way how you directly should do it. And I will show you then how you execute a proper MPI or basically later a proper C program on a HPC program using this scheduler which you can see a little bit, the login node will do a certain commands, dispatching it as a scheduler, and then the scheduler will be responsible of saying, you can be compute to zero, to one, to two, whatever. Right, so this is something which is, of course, more dramatic if you have now a 24 hour climate simulation, if you have a big clustering of big data, where you have hours and hours of runtime, the hello was of course a very simple command, so there it's not so dramatic when you execute this on the login node. So let us then basically break here for 10 minutes before we understand then how you properly execute something on HPC systems by using batch systems or as they also called schedulers. So see you in 10 minutes.